Um, so welcome, my, uh, also from my side, my name is Axel Tilcher. Um, I'm now host, uh, sitting here in, in Denmark. Um, and uh, thanks to, to Alex and his team for organizing this workshop with us, um, where part of it is also presenting our software SimNips. And um, as already pointed out by, by Alex, part of, of the challenge is to really say how good models are, um, just how accurately their um, physically uh, predicted fields are. And that's something I'll, I'll cover now in the following. So I'll talk about one of one method which we can use to um, validate actually the the simulation results, and I'll um, give also like a summary of of the status of this technique, and and also point out towards future challenges uh, which still need to be resolved in order to really then apply this method on a on a broader level. This method is called MR um, current density imaging. Well, this was already introduced before. That's our pipeline, which we developed here in, in Denmark um, since a few years now. Um, so uh, it's uh, called SimNips. Um, many of you will be familiar with that. So usually what you do is you, you start with, with MR images of the subjects, which you then segment to have some anatomical head model, which you then take further to make a physical head model out of it by assigning connectivities. And uh, for example, what you see here is that, that you have connectivity um, of, of skull is low and of, of everything here outside is something higher. And then the highest connectivity is CSF, which is coded here in red. And the brain is somewhere in between. Once you have that, uh, you can then start um, applying a, a numerical method, for example, FEM, but there's also other techniques like boundary element method, for example. To, to calculate an electric field either for electric stimulation and for or for magnetic stimulation and and now it's relatively fast it takes yeah less than one minute to take to do such a simulation now the question is obviously uh, what can go wrong in the sense that even though you have individual information the fields then are not really as accurate as you'd like to have them um, so before I go into the um, MR method, I'd like to now point out a few error sources. So one would be that actually the, the implementation of your FEM method is not accurate enough. Um, so we put a lot of work into that to make sure that SimNips actually now has an error of around 5% when you use like the standard head meshes which are automatically generated um, from the modeling, um, uh, modeling software basically, which is included in SimNips. And you can decrease the error by increasing the resolution of the head mesh, meaning that the, the tetraeder, so the um, compartments which we use for calculating then the local fields are just made, made smaller. But when you make them uh, much coarser, then the error increases rather, rather quickly, I would say. Now then the question is obviously, why did we choose 5%? Um, isn't that, is that high, is it low? Um, the, the reason for 5% is that we think that this amount of numerical errors so far is absolutely acceptable given the other error sources which we have. Uh, one is segmentation errors and my colleague Ula Puanti will talk uh, after that much more. I just want to briefly um, hint towards um, the, the problem here. So here we would have a segmentation from MMR uh, here in, in red, the skull highlighted here. And that's obviously a good segmentation. Here you see parts of the skull are missing. And this can happen quite often actually um, when you don't select the right input images. And then also the results differ quite a bit. For example, here in this targeted area, um, it's, it's quite different. Also here in the frontal areas, the distribution is quite different. So you can have quite dramatic changes because you simply don't represent the anatomy uh, well. But even when you do that, you have further challenges. Um, you uh, actually then have to assign connectivities to the tissues. You have to say, well, this is CSF and this has this connectivity and this is skin and this has now this connectivity. And um, when you look into literature, then you find relatively widespread values for each of the tissue types which we are using in these uh, simulations. Um, one example um, would be here compact bone. Uh, compact bone is the least conductive and that is clear that's uh, relatively stable but when you see 
here we just model the spread of literature values which are reported in literature here by by a coarse probability density function you see that's a quite wide spread also for spongy bone it's a quite wide spread the same for all tissues basically you have this rough sorting that you have compact bone which is the least conductive and then um, you have spongy bone then you have all the other tissues here and you have csf which is a little bit better conductive than than the rest but you have a relatively large uncertainty you just don't know better uh, what the the best values are here um, which should be assigned um, to to the model when it does its simulations and we were wondering here how much does this actually matter for the outcome of the simulations which we have and for that we used a, a method called gpc um, this was a work done also in collaboration with with guys from max planck institute in, in leipzig the outcome would be now shown here for examples for a tms for a focal tdcs montage and this would be a standard tdcs montage you see the resulting fields here in this row and they look like expected. So when you have a TMS uh, um, stimulation with a double coil, then you have a peak of the stimulation here. When you have a focal TDCS montage, you also can relatively well steer the currents towards one region here, one superficial region. And when you have an unfocal montage, you have also the expected results that your, the current spread a large area basically. The interesting part is more now the second column, which shows the, the variability of this field, um, given that we don't know the conductivities very well. And you see that uh, when we assume that the can, conductivities can vary, then this doesn't affect the estimates of the TMS fields a lot. So that's why there's not much to see. But on contrary, for TTCS, it's, it's a big issue, meaning that even though the, the estimate here of the peak field might, for example, be around 0.3 volts per meter, um, it might differ quite a bit in reality. This is another way of showing this result. Again, just what was done here is we were reading out the peak field strength in gray matter. As you see for TMS, the distribution is relatively sharp. So even though the conductivities are not so um, certain, um, this doesn't affect TMS so much but actually TDCS um, is much more affected. So you, um, you might simulate one, uh, you might, your simulation result might, might indicate that you stimulate with, with that value, 0.8 volts per meter as peak field, but in reality, you might have a much larger spread here. So what to do about that? So one option is obviously to first of all, validate how, how good you are and how much these, these putative um, problems affect then the outcome, outcome of your simulations. And in principle, you have two, um, two methods so far available. One is that you do intercranial recordings um, with, um, and that's something um, which um, my colleague Ulla Ponti will again talk more about in, in the next talk. Um, and, uh, or you go uh, for non-invasive technique um, with MR and I'll mostly cover this part now in the following. Before I do that, I want to briefly point out why having such a method might be an interesting idea. Um, so basically, what, what are the challenges when, which you have when you have intercranial recordings? Well, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Obviously, you cannot do it on every person. It's only feasible in, in selected patients and maybe in animal models, and, and, but not as a standard usage. So you always have a restricted um, access to this, this kind of data. You cannot do it in an, on an individual level. You also have spatially sparse measurements. You only record actually at the electrode contacts, and this is maybe a few hundred contacts, but not, not more. And actually, as, as Ulla will point out later on, to obtain really accurate measurements with this technique, even though it seems to be, uh, on the first sight, it seems to be a very straightforward um, way of doing it, it's actually not that easy. And he will highlight that, that further. So let's go to the alternative, which would be to try to use MR measurements to record the current flow. The question is, how does it work in principle? And actually, it's, it's relatively straightforward. The basic principle is relatively straightforward. So you have here a current source, which leads now currents through the head here from one electrode to the other. And these currents, which are flowing through the head, they also create a, every current flow basically creates its magnetic field. And that's also happening here. So the currents which flow through the head create their own magnetic field. And this magnetic field then changes the magnetic field 
of the MR scanner. And this change results in changes of the images which you take with the MR scanner. So what you can do is you can lead the currents in one direction through the head, and then you can lead it in the other direction through the head. So you have the positive and the negative um, pair of images here. And these differ slightly, these images. And by taking basically the difference of those images, you get information about how the magnetic field looks like, which was induced by the current flow. So you don't measure the, the currents themselves, but you measure their magnetic field. It's mostly the face images which carry this information. This is more or less the images which you usually don't use. So I think not much of many of you will be familiar with, with face images. Usually you, you work with magnitude images. But these uh, images here change when you apply currents to it. Once you have then the uh, magnetic field recorded, um, which was created by the current flow in the head, then you can go forward and apply reconstruction algorithms to recover then the current flow or also the conductivity. So what are the main challenges here? Um, so one big challenge is actually that our current flow for electric stimulation is relatively weak. With TACS, for example, we have one to two milliampere um, baseline to peak amplitude usually. And when you do the, the calculations and you quickly find out that uh, we need a relatively high sensitivity. So to put that here a little bit into perspective, we have a Tesla uh, MR scanner, which has maybe a three Tesla magnetic field, static magnetic field strength. And we try to um, detect changes of this three Tesla field, which are less than one nano Tesla. So this is really challenging. This is, uh, re requires methods which are really highly sensitive. We started doing uh, that, uh, developing these methods a few years ago by first um, um, screening through existing MR sequences, which uh, were already known to have relatively good sensitivity um, for, um, for yeah, face information, and then um, selected the most promising candidates and systematically optimized them further. Um, in addition, um, we found out that um, initially the results were not too reliable um, because also the cables which actually lead around lead the currents to the electrodes and um, away again, um, they also induce an electric field. And this is superimposed with the electric field of the current flow in the brain. And when you don't account for that, you, you have basically um, um, inaccurate uh, re results. Finally, after resolving these two things, we could then image um, current flow in the brain. And we did that here initially for two current directions as shown here and here. And um, that's the, the results which I'll then, then present as, as the, um, well, the state at, at which we are at the moment, basically. Um, this guy here is Xi'an Göksu. He actually did most of the work. Um, and um, uh, partly as his PhD thesis and now also as postdoc. So coming to the sequence, it's a so-called steady state free precession free induction decay um, sequence. It's a wonderful name. Um, the, for, for here, the, the important part is that it has in generally a good sensitivity um, to the current induced phase uh, changes. It's also linear in the range of the currents which we're using it, um, meaning that uh, when, we re, uh, when we have a, yeah, a, a phase response, which is double the phase response of at another position, we know that the B field there is also double the strength. It's relatively fast, so we can do these measurements in a few minutes. And uh, it's relatively reasonable, uh, robust to physiological noise when after we had introduced these multi-gradient readouts. Um, in principle, um, Face image information, the more sensitive you make a sequence to that, the more sensitive it is also to physiological noise. So this is a real challenge to bo balance both here. But in a way, we got a reasonable res um, um, sensitivity here, basically. When starting with the measurements, we initially obtained quite, quite varying results, um, which were not very plausible. And we then figured out that's actually due to the cables, which are leading the currents um, to, to the head and away again. So in order to account for that, we um, need to correct for that. 
we did that by actually coating the cables so that they are visible on MR scans here. So this would be the cable. This would be electrodes here attached to the head. And as you see, um, you, you can then easily track basically the cables and the cable pathways here. And basically, when you have tracked them, you can calculate the magnetic field, which is created by the cables using Biosaba law and subtracted from the measurements. In the following, I want to show a little bit the need for doing that. So that would be the cable pathway which we uh, had um, just because we use commercially available um, equipment there um, for use of, of TES in the MR scanner. And as you see, these cables are not very far away from the head. To demonstrate that this really makes an effect, we ran a very simple simulation study where we simulated this pathway here, this current pathway, by this straight line here. And we just moved um, the distance of the line of, um, closer or further away from the head. So we would image one slice here around this height. And then this pathway would be uh, moved further, uh, closer or further away uh, from, from the head here in the simulation. And the outcome is like that. The reference would be here. So this would be without this effect. This would be the magnetic field caused by the currents only flowing through the head. So that's what we want to record. But now when we have um, the, these, the cables relatively close to the head, then we actually see that they um, get more and more um, dominant um, and influence actually the recorded field quite a lot when, when you're close uh, to the imaging slice. And in reality, we are somehow actually in this range, so it really matters. Uh, so we have to really correct for that. In order to check whether the correction works, uh, again, it's just it's uh, tracking the cables, calculating the magnetic field, and subtracting it. We had now here a cable which was just flow, uh, around the head. So there is here in this experiment, there was no current flowing through the head, just a cable around the head, which then created this very strong. Um, magnetic fields here, which we recorded. And um, we also then um, tracked the path, used it to calculate the magnetic field and subtracted the calculated field then from the recorded field. And this is the result. So that what is basically correcting for the effect that we, that the currents here also flow through the, the cable. And um, in order to say whether this is now a good result or not, we compare it to the reference case, which was without any current injection. And as you see, the noise patterns are quite similar. Overall, the noise floor is still here slightly increased, um, but it's absolutely, absolutely usable for practical purposes. So this would be now the, the measurements which we have done. Um, again, I'd first like to point out the results without cable correction. We have five subjects here. Um, with uh, current directions from um, right to left and from anterior to posterior. And as you see here, the results are quite variable, which you have also here for AP. Um, the, the pattern changes quite dramatically. After correcting for the, uh, for the cable, the stray fields, actually it gets much more, much more um, similar to each other, much more reliable, it seems. Um, so there here we have really the expected result that, for example, for, for current flow from anterior to posterior, according to the, to the so-called um, right-hand rule, we have now here negative magnetic field. Uh, so that's the one component, the Z component of the magnetic field, a positive here. So that, that sounds, sounds reasonable. Um, we also have similar effects here, or uh, results here, even though left, right was a little bit more, more variable. But so far, so good. That was, was quite, quite promising. Um, but that's actually not what, what we wanted to know. Um, we wanted to now really compare um, or compare the, uh, these results with simulated results to see how good our simulations are. And instead of really directly um, comparing the magnetic field, we, uh, our aim was to um, compare the currents, current flow, because the current flow is more the component which then matters for neural excitation. For that, you can run a reconstruction. So when you have um, measured B fields, you can do a reconstruction with an uh, algorithm called projected um, J algorithm. I'll come back later to that. And what you see here is when you have a current flow here, as expected, you have a higher current strength here. 
yeah, in the interhemispheric cleft, you also have an increased uh, current with strength, and then here in the end, uh, the currents again um, accumulate and then flow out. A similar thing is also seen here for left right, where the current strength is higher here, and then it decreases a little bit. Now, when you look at the simulations, you see that um, they actually look a little bit different. There's much more detail, and this is because this reconstruction method is, is simply not perfect. So instead of directly comparing this part here with this part, what we did is to basically uh, mimic um, the same sequence of events here in the simulation. So basically saying, okay, we have a current flow and this current flow creates a magnetic field. And then we reconstruct again the current flow using the same algorithm from the magnetic field. And as you see here, um, this results in a certain um, uh, loss of resolution. Mm -hmm. But then we are in a position that we can directly compare basically um, the simulated current flow with the measured one. And the outcome there is um, that so far we have an average R square between the simulated and measured current flow of 71%, which is a good starting point, I would say. Uh, again, we only have five subjects, two direction each. We have a range of 55% to 91%. So some subjects really work out extremely nicely and others there still need for improvement. So um, that's a good starting point. Question is now, is it all now perfect and shiny? Well, um, there are still challenges which we want to tackle now in, in the future. So the one thing is that um, to um, uh, really make full usage of this information, we also would like to reconstruct conductivities. And what are the challenges here? Well, the challenges are that you go to, uh, you need reconstruction algorithms. And these reconstruction algorithms here um, to go from the B field to the current density, and then usually further from this uh, information to the, in, uh, to the conductivities, they rely on taking the spatial gradient of the prior results. So what is the, the problem there? Um, so when you take the gra spatial gradient of this, there's no problem. When you take the spatial gradient of measured data, which has, has noise in, then uh, you, you tend to amplify high frequency, spatial high frequency noise by that. So the reconstructions are specifically sensitive to noise in the, in the uh, measurements. Then the question is, and when you, when you apply another reconstruction step, you again have the same problem. So you have a strong noise amplification by having this double step here. So the question is, how good do we have to be? This is a simple simulation study here again. This is a simulated field, um, um, B field, uh, for, for a current flow from anterior to posterior through the brain. And all we did here is to add noise so that it's basically the amount of noise is comparable with the sensitivity which we have so far. And with that, we reconstructed then the, the current density again. Um, it's a little bit more noisy as I showed before, and this is because we didn't try to do any additional filtering. So this is really the, the raw reconstruction from the raw, raw BZ data. You might try to improve it a little bit, but it gives a good impression on, on how good the, the step works. And then when you do another step to go from here, from the current densities to the conductivities, again, you have to do uh, another spatial gradient, which is indicated by this wonderful um, equation here. This here is not the conductivity, it just shows the information which needs then to be taken from the, uh, or reconstructed from the measurements to reconstruct the conductivities. And you see it's extremely noisy here. Now in the ideal case, this would look like that. With such a noiseless case, you can uh, start starting reconstruct, uh, reconstructing your conductivities quite reliable. Now in order to get close to it, we see that we would it have to decrease really the, the um, amount of noise in our measurements quite dramatically, or a factor of 10 approximately, or we need additional prior information and likely uh, it will be a mixture of both which we need to get to reliable reconstructions um, from, from the measurement data. Another topic which we still want to work on is to improve the reconstruction algorithms themselves. <coughs> Sorry. Um, because they, they work actually quite well, um, but um, they have been developed um, to work in phantoms. And these phantoms 
um, often have a very um, standard structure so that you have a homogeneous background region. And in this background region, you embed parts um, of, of some material which has a different conductivity. For example, here, um, the, this chicken breast um, has a lower conductivity than the background. This would be have here a higher conductivity. And this is uh, obviously different from the head, where um, we don't have a homogeneous background, but we have skin, we have skull, and so on. So let's, but let's first look at, at the results here. Um, so when we do our measurements, then we see something like that. That would be the uh, magnetic field um, recorded for measurements uh, with current injection, either here from left to right or from anterior, uh, anterior posterior. We can use this to again reconstruct the current density similar to as I showed in the human case before. And as you see, it actually works really well here for this, uh, for this phantom. So we inject currents from here to here and you see you have a strong currents here. Then they start flowing around this part which has a low conductivity here. You see a similar thing. They flow around this, this uh, um, object which is injected in, in the phantom. Then they assemble here again, they flow out. A similar thing is seen when you uh, have currents which flow from anterior posterior in this direction. Now here, just because the, the direction we have to look uh, of the current flow, we have to look at the black results. What you see here is that, well, the, the currents enter here, then you have a highly conductive part, so they try really flowing through that. And then they distribute again, but they circumvent this, this, um, um, this object here again. And here they assemble again. Uh, there's a higher current density and they flow out. So this is an, a quite accurate reconstruction of, of, the, of the J. And with that, you can also come to a quite accurate uh, reconstruction of the conductivities. This is a relatively recent um, algorithm. So I'm just presenting now data or results from, from, this, um, from, from this work here, um, where they actually combined these, this kind of information uh, additionally with diffusion tensor images of the image to have really um, quite good reconstructions of the conductivity distribution, even um, giving information about the anisotropy of the conductivity. So that's quite, quite nice to see. The problem now is that when you use this algorithm for humans, then um, as already shown before, when you have such a current flow pattern and you go through this reconstruction step, then you lose much of these details, again indicated here. So much of the information about that the currents go into the sulky and then they are higher in, in the ventricles is, is more or less lost here. And this is, uh, this is a limitation of of this uh, projected uh, J um, algorithm. It also has further limitations because what we do is that we actually measure the B field, not in the complete slice, but we cannot really record it in skin and skull because this does not give reliable MR signal. We only can get reliable MR signal from CSF and brain. So that's why I always show this mask here. Yeah. and. What we did now, um, just to demonstrate the, uh, the impact of that, is to now just use the current flow inside the skin and skull and um, say everywhere else it's basically zero and run this th through the reconstruction algorithm. So basically the current flow here also creates a magnetic field in the measurement slice in this inner part, looking like that. And then the algorithm would reconstruct an artificial current flow, which is actually not existing. The current flow was this here, but it reconstructs an artificial current flow basically here inside the head. So this is something which is so far not accounted for in this algorithm, but should be in order to get to a more reliable uh, re uh, reconstructions of J, of the current density from those measurements. So, um, Obviously, when you have such a situation, it's still it's not yet a good starting point for conductivity reconstructions. I, I'm very positive that we can go in that direction um, in the next few years. But I'd like just to point out that so far, I think that we need to do a little bit further improvements of the measurement sensitivity. And we also have to work a little bit more on our reconstruction approaches um, to make them 
suited also for the human in vivo case um, and um, basically, basically adapt them um, instead of just working for phantoms accurately. With that, I would I like to again thank um, Shihan doing much of the work. Hassan Ergolo um, started recently and now is looking into the, the construction algorithms more. And I'd like to um, thank um, the, the co-workers um, also of my lab um, for, for um, helping with this work here. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Axel, for the talk. It was very interesting. And we have one question from the audience. Um, when you talked about uh, numerical error of FBM, uh, how do you define the numerical error of 5%? What is the golden standard that you're comparing the result with? Ah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, so there are two options you have usually. Um, the, the, um, the one is that you go to um, simplified geometries where you have the analytical solution. That, that would be a sphere model, for example. So there you know the ground truth. And um, you would compare there the simulated uh, with the with the finite element method, for example, with the with this analytical solutions because they are they should be exact. When you do that, then you end up actually with much better numerical errors because these uh, these ge geometries are also very simple. So um, what we did here instead is to say, well, um, we demonstrate that um, the error converges or the difference between the simulations converges when we go from coarse head models to finer and finer and finer head models. Um, so what we, uh, what we did here is to say, well, when we have an extremely high resolution head model with, with a 200 million tetraeder or so, um, then the remaining numerical error is really small because we see that our, our error difference converges. And that's how we define the numerical error of 5%. So the, the numerical error is the difference of, of the simulation at this coarser level compared to our very fine level. I think this is the most, uh, the most sensible way of doing that because there you can really look into errors for uh, complex geometries um, where um, errors more easily increase compared to, um, to, uh, to simpler geometries. Thank you. And one more question. Uh, which hardware are uh, you are using to acquire MR images? Do you account for possible phase wraps on the phase images? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's actually, uh, uh, it's not easy. So um, we actually use a standard scanner. It's a standard three Tesla Siemens Prisma scanner. Um, that, is, uh, that is not the challenge. Um, the challenge is to have, as already pointed out, by, by Lucia is to have the face images accurately, accurately reconstructed. And the face wraps is one issue, but it's actually a very minor issue because we always have positive and negative current injection. And the face wraps as such, they stay constant uh, whilst versus the uh, difference in the face between the positive and ne negative, uh, we can just subtract to get this information out. The more, more challenging thing is actually that the Face images which are reconstructed on Siemens scanners are just wrong. That doesn't matter for uh, for standard usage, but that's why we really start reconstruction from raw data, raw case-based data, uh, which we then combine. So it's it's a little bit um, tedious to do that, but we need to do that to have accurate face information. 